thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, we do have a handout, but we only have 25 of them, so if you could share with your neighbor, I'd appreciate that. The handout is essentially the transcription of some of this interaction in Spanish. So my name is Carl Blythe, and Il Coik is my colleague at the University of Texas at, at Austin, and we're both interested in pragmatics and applying pragmatics to intercultural issues. So let me begin right here. Um, intercultural educators have recently called for more linguistically oriented approaches to explore intercultural communication. Along these lines, Ketchkiss has, uh, has po pioneered intercultural pragmatics, a field that explores how speakers from different language cultures negotiate meaning. Keshkis, and this is 2014, contends that intercultural pragmatics reconciles macro and micro perspectives. The macro perspective deals with establishing norms, patterns, and expectations about language use in speech communities, and the micro perspective includes the study of interactions between individuals. So this notion um, comes also from a, a, a recent article by Thorne and Ivkovich, uh, 2015, and they were examining the uh, Eurovision Song Contest, something that's very popular right now in Europe, uh, as an example of multilingual and multicultural uh, um, online spaces where fans and nationalism, nationalisms come into contact and where linguistic and ethnic identities are negotiated. The major claim in this article was that the activity in these online contact zones presents a, ver a very real challenge to the code approach to language that is language as long or as an abstract system that's static, that's independent from human action and so forth. And yet they point out that, they readily note that language as a static object, something that we teach of, uh, to our students, appears to be more visible to them, appears, appears to be more visible to people. So the point really is that first order phenomena, which they call languaging, the actual interaction discourse, is not as obvious to our students as language or the abstraction, second order, long. In addition, the notion of hyperreflexivity is also important to our research. Um, and this appears in a recent book, 2013, Reflexivity and in Language in Intercultural Education. So the reflexivity of the language instructor, the professor, or the researcher working with students trying to promote their own reflexivity. So we're aware of their awareness. And it's defined here in this book as a heightened awareness of our use, our being uh, researchers or teachers, our use and misuse of representations, methodologies, and our own positionings and engagements throughout the research project. So we're also researching ourselves. And by the way, so Dale is in red and I'm in blue. That's our color coding for ourselves. You weren't supposed to tell them that. Um, okay, well, so for pragmatics researchers, um, a problem and a challenge is to interpret linguistic data, right? Some meanings have to be inferred, um, and there are things that are directly unobservable, like thoughts, inner thoughts, etc. Implicatures, Im you have to have inference and presupposition, and you can't observe those readily. So um, when you come to objectively reporting the data or the facts of the data, that, that is a problem. Um, so, so what does the research do, researcher does is they is he or she re relies on things that he she or she can read, such as the facial expressions and the gestures, the term sequences, um, what the people actually say, of course, and how they react to them, and the intonational patterns. Um, but what we find un unobservable are emotions, for example, the inner states of, of people, mental states, excuse me, um, the thought, their thoughts, um, and sometimes you can see a smile and not really know what the meaning is, you can guess at it. So we are proposing today uh, another kind of method that to look at this kind of data um, based in psychotherapy. And it involves introspective questioning by a facilitator. Um, and this is dealing with metapragmatics, which is reflecting on language and um, eliciting commentary by the participants and the data um, on their own pragmatic behavior. Lucy talks about contextualizing pragmatics, that metapragmatic activity signals to listeners how pragmatic forms are to be interpreted appropriately. 
and Hanks um, in 93 called for a metalinguistic elicitation as a field method. So we sort of took all of this as our background. Um, we started out with uh, actually a very simplistic question, which was, okay, we'll get these, these data, and then um, I'll come in with my analysis, and he will, after um, doing some metapragmatic activity with the participants, see what he gets out of it. So we're sort of pr comparing. Uh, we ended up got getting a whole lot of different things. So um, we sort of settled on these questions for the study. How do two dialogue participants who are completely unfamiliar and unknown to each other beforehand reach an understanding in communicating each other's meanings and feelings and also come to some kind of intersubjectivity? And secondly, how can students understand their dialogue by understanding their unobservable behavior uh, of each other, excuse me, um, and implicatures and their, their own, excuse me, and other uh, pragmatic researches, re resources that can be ambiguous, such as smiles and laughter. And thirdly, what is the effect of this facilitator's or teacher's questions on the metapragmatic discussion? So our methodology was pretty straightforward. We only have two people here talking in a dialogue, a native Spanish speaker from Colombia, um, a learner, an American student in fifth semester of Spanish. And our procedure was, uh, again, very straightforward. We videotaped the discussion. We gave them prompts, and they started, they had about a 10 to 50 minute discussion. Uh, we were videotaping it on the, the desktop computer, so the embedded, the, the, the camcorder. We were using ScreenFlow, which is a proprietary screencasting software. It just lets you take videos and play with the videos in different ways. It's used primarily for usability testing or in, uh, interface testing of websites. So it, it allows you to, ha to, to, um, to look at people's faces and capture their voices and also have a, an image of the, the website. But we were using it for a very different um, object here. Obviously, we're, we're looking at pragmatics. And we were hoping this, this would lessen the observer's paradox because they were not at all aware. You don't see the recording device at all. So the methodology was, again, simple. I handed out to, uh, prompts. And they were really discussing the prompts were uh, taken from Cultura, from MIT. Uh, they were talking about um, raising children and the notion of individualism, how does raising a child to become an individual in society and so forth. So they looked at the prompts and they started in, and we did, we were videotaping the discussion. Uh, and immediately following their discussion, when they kind of ran out of steam and stopped talking, I turned to the computer and I became the facilitator, and we watched their uh, their interaction together. I would stop the videotape at different parts, and I would say, you know, you just you smiled there. Why did you smile? Um, or what were you thinking when you smiled? That kind of thing. Very much like a think aloud, but it was a prompted think aloud. And then, of course, as Dale said, it gave us two data sets. It gave us the original, uh, their original discussion that she did a pragmatic analysis on, and then a metapragmatic uh, discussion that I analyzed. So this is a screenshot, but let me see if I can escape this and show you what it actually looks like. Um, and uh, so it, this is now, it, it plays on QuickTime Player. So here are two individuals, and I will cue it up to right where they start. Was, uh, gave up okay, even before you were starting, what were you thinking? Okay, so she just read the first prompt. She says, pues, que papel, so what are the roles? And I stopped her right away, and I said, so what were you thinking? So you notice here the large screen is there, was what they're looking at. That was the original discussion, and then the small screen their faces are looking directly into the uh, computer. So they're looking at the big image there, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Or feeling. I Thinking was, or feeling. I was a little bit nervous, I'll say that, because I was touching my neck, which I was like, I think I should actually <laughs> say something. I have like a nervous habit when I get nervous, I touch my neck. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that at some point, I was like, oh, I'm touching my neck, and I put my hand down. <laughs> <laughs> you were aware of being nervous? Yeah, I was. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about the questions, um, that it might be like a really, uh, it was going to 
to be different points of view mm -hmm. on on the actual answers. Okay, so that gives you a, a, a enough of a feel, I think, for um, what we're trying to do here. I came, I started looking at the data, and I should say that while they were taping, um, I was present, but I, I was not paying attention to what they were doing. I was fooling around technical things. I was, I was just realizing I hadn't turned off my phone, hoping it wasn't going to go off, and so things like that. But I, and besides that, I've done so many tapings that they kind of bore me. So um, I, d I came back later, and I started looking at the data, and um, I my role was minimal um, at first, and so now I'm going to come back and analyze that. So what pragmatic principles seem to jump out at me to be guiding this encounter between the two? And the two, that, two things that I noticed were mainly um, negative politeness, because they were participants who didn't know each other, and this first time you had the d power dynamic, unfamiliar um, native speaker and a student who didn't speak Spanish very well, and then also their search for common ground. So those are the two things that I started looking at that were operating. Um, so the f I used the negative politeness um, theory by uh, Brown and Levinson and also Spencer Ode, and that is the desire not to impose or be imposed on. Um, I interpreted this because of the space that they were giving each other and how it was striking to me how they were sort of like sitting there together. They didn't look at each other. They would either look at their paper or if somebody looked at them, they would look off in the distance <laughs> or at the door or something like that. They didn't look at each other for the first half of that conversation. Um, so they were having parallel conversations. They seemed to be displaying uh, their answer and then Somebody would say, display their answer, and then the other person would display his answer, et cetera. Um, and uh, they avoided looking at each other, as I said, and so they did not have any risk of threat to face. Um, and they, it seemed to be probing to me uh, what would be a, a safe topic or what would be a safe stance to take in expressing these opinions. So, um, yeah, let me go on. And then... Uh, I like. I noticed, in, and you can see this on your handout. Um, in the line twenty-one is is which is halfway through. Um, that's when um, the the native speaker s sort of immediately jumped in to help her clarify her meaning, and that's really the first time that there was kind of any interaction between the two of them. Um, it's also the. Uh, they were, as I said, probing for what stances to avoid or to, to take. And the first 20 to 50 lines was really just display. Okay. Um, and common ground, as far as common ground goes, um, these are mutual knowledge, beliefs, and assumptions that are supposed to be necessary for communication. Um, there was almost no common ground at first, even though they both had the same piece of paper or with the same questions, excuse me, they didn't have cultural backgrounds that were similar or anything like that. Um, also, imagine you have the uh, additional stress of having two pe people who didn't know each other. They had to interact on film. They knew they were being taped, although they didn't see a camera. Um, and two professors sitting there in the same room. So you had, uh, we saw, I saw a lot of implicatures, stance, um, expectations, gestures, and types of speech acts for their pragmatics, but it changed over the course of the, the talk. And um, I noticed on, for example, um, line 28, uh, the native speaker switched from using the te, the you informal, to the se, which is the indefinite passive voice. And so he de depersonalizes his opinion. Also, he, instead of saying, you do this, or he says, there are people who do this. And the tu pronoun, the, and yeah, the, the you pronoun is used only much later. So his opinion comes off being very tentative. He doesn't want to impose his opinion on them, um, on her, excuse me. 
And she is immediately, initially overwhelmed. She's, she wrinkles her brow. She takes a lot of deep breaths. She smiles to herself, and she covers her mouth. Um, she gestures when she wants to give up her turn. She sings, I, sings, sings things like, I don't know, or no, you know, say. And she smiles to give up her turn as well. And, but he uh, starts reassuring her in halfway through by nodding and scaffolding onto her in statements um, to help her out. And that is really the first time, as I said, she has eye contact with him. Um, the, she also states an example of a video that she had seen um, about children in Japan. And, and it was interesting to me that whenever a, he expressed an opinion about children, he became the child. So he would say, yes, the children do this. And then she started doing the same thing. She said, oh, yes, the children do that. Um, so there was kind of a, a coordination there. That was the pragmatic analysis, the metapragmatic analysis, or the uh, analysis of their discussion about their discussion. I took Dale's transcription uh, and her analysis and then compared it then to what the um, students actually said they were doing. And I was primarily interested in the notion of planning. What was their planning behavior? Um, as Dale said, that the embodiment, so the different kinds of gestures, and also their comprehension, which would, would be invisible to us. And on your handout, the first question I asked was the one I just showed you was, um, okay, what were you thinking? Even before you said anything, what were you thinking? And um, we come up with a, a communicative asymmetry right from the very beginning, the native speaker and the non-native speaker. She was aware and she said, oh, I, I'm touching my neck. That's a signal. I, I know I do that. I'm very, I was nervous. And so she was very much worried about her performance and having performance anxiety issues. Uh, the native speaker was thinking to himself, I don't know who she is. I know that she must be an American, um, so I'm probably going to have to adjust my language. He talked about not using dialect. He talked about she, you, he, uh, using so-called neutral language and so forth to communicate, to, to communicate clearly. Um, the next question, a couple lines later I asked, was I noticed a smile. So again, as a facilitator, I'm watching. The, they had just completed the task. I'm watching it with them. I noticed something, and I said, you smiled there. Why did you smile? And she said, I don't know, um, which is important. She said that she was nervous, and she was able to, at that point, talk about, I was nervous, and then I didn't get nervous, but then I got nervous again. But she actually said, I, I don't know, to, to that question. So that's an important point. This is not a panacea. This raises things to their awareness, but sometimes they simply don't know what they do. Um, and, of course, the, 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 the basic, the, the obvious thing is that the emotions are highly transitory. They change from line, from turn to turn. In the next comment, just a couple of lines later, I noticed again she smiled and she was turning away. So I commented on that behavior. And then she confirmed, yes, I was nervous. So it was kind of a, an anxious smile. Um, but she also said that she couldn't recover. She was kind of doing a lexical search in her mind, and she couldn't recover the word, what she wanted. And she was turning away because she said she just couldn't process the Spanish that kept coming at her. She had to turn away and actually think to herself what the word was so as she did her search. So I had already made a, a misassumption there. I was thinking that she looked very kind of, un, kind of bored and, and disengaged. She wasn't at all. She was trying to disengage because there was too much Spanish. So gaze here may index some kind of a cognitive issue, which, of course, is entirely invisible to observers or even to each other. This points up, so this is something, reminds us of something that Keshka said in his book in that the interactional dynamics in intercultural situations are fundamentally different than monolingual uh, settings. Therefore, a lot of pragmatic research is really not always applicable. So um, the next comment, comment four, um, Let's see, A acknowledges that he wanted to help. I, I asked a question um, about, uh, she had just, she, 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 there was a, a period where it was very convoluted. She wasn't able to put together a, a grammatical sentences. And I could see him leaning in. And um, he said that he, at that point, he was, he wanted to help her, but he didn't know how to help her because he didn't know what she was trying to say. And in line 23, when she said the word lejos, far, he suddenly realized, oh, she must be talking about social distance, and it came clear. And that's when he uttered distancing. 
So again, um, you can really pinpoint areas where uh, the whole comprehension process, the inference, happens. Um, and finally, the last comment, uh, in Dale's pragmatic analysis, she, she uh, looked at the word uh, individualismo, which was uttered by the, the, uh, the learner very early on, but it seemed out of context, and so she talked about it as a non sequitur. It, he said it wasn't a non sequitur to him. He was actually, he made sense of it, because later on she starts to talk about this thing that she saw somewhere on the internet, a study, a video between Japanese children and American children, and he said she must be talking about their developing individu different kinds of individualism in their children. Um, he was right. Both of us had no idea what she was talking about. So preliminary findings. Um, well, it does show that you can enhance awareness of interactional patterns. We found that they were very talkative about their inner states. Uh, they didn't always know, though, what their inner state was because it changed so rapidly. Cognitive explanations for gaze behavior was very important for us because I was really misinterpreting. It always looked like she was disconnecting, but she wasn't. Um, she was interested in what he was saying, but she couldn't. She just had to stop the flow of incoming information. I got it. Please stop. Um, they were able to explain why they were making certain linguistic choices in the moment, so his, his, his reference to neutral language. And of course, she was very aware of her linguistic deficiencies and was able to articulate them. So our pri preliminary questions, we're calling them preliminary because this is preliminary research. We're trying a new, new methodology. Um, the question arises is where should pragmatic analysis begin? Because pragmatic analysis typically begins with the transcript. So we even started before they, they uttered any, any, anything. What kinds of facilitating questions are most effective? I was the facilitator, and I noticed, again, that I was asking different kinds of questions. I tried to be relatively neutral and ask open-ended questions. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? They were therapeutic questions. Um, but sometimes I led the witness. Uh, sometimes I noticed I asked a question, how did it feel when he helped you out? That was my interpretation. Is that good or is that bad? I don't know. Um, what, should the what should I do, the facil facilitator do, when the informant says they don't know? Um, and finally, what can, inform can informants improve metalinguistic awareness with repeated uh, discussion? We don't have evidence for that. This is just a one-time uh, study. So to conclude. we got out of this is that this metapragmatic discussion could lead the people, the students, um, to a better pragmatic awareness of ho how they, what they're doing when they talk to each other in different languages. Um, also, this metapragmatic discussion helps us as researchers because it gives us a better, a richer data set, of course. And now we have uh, new data. We're going to test out our analyses um, with other tapings. And uh, we were able to uh, identify some unobservable phenomena, like what's going on behind the smiles or what's going on between the two when they're looking away. Is it because they don't like each other or what? Um, this isn't a panacea, of course. We don't, uh, there are limitations to what you can draw out of this. But um, another thing about this uh, software is you have this, these multiple screens that allow you to view your data and also let the um, interlocutors view review it and um, express what they're what they were doing pragmatically, and the screen flow software, which is as we said a screen casting uh, software, allows for different levels of meta analysis. So you have uh, a frame within a frame within a frame. Thank you very much. <laughs>